Hey everybody and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast as always is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end user experience issues, regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, the innovator in adaptive workspace management solutions. And also, of course, by Policy Pack Software, where you use group policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. If you enjoy the podcast each week, you have these fantastic sponsors to thank. And now for some news. Well, Patch Tuesday just passed again, and it is actually somewhat of a light month in terms of the number of security issues fixed. 44 security issues have been addressed this month, 7 critical and 37 important bugs. One is an actively exploited zero day in the wild. The Hacker News states, this is actually the smallest update since December 2019. Patched products this month include Windows, .NET Core, Visual Studio, Azure, Microsoft Graphics Component, Office, the Scripting Engine, Codex Library, Remote Desktop Client, and more. I won't go through all of them, but there are a few worth highlighting, including CVE-2021-36948, which is an elevation of privilege flaw affecting Windows Update Medic Service, and it comes with a severity score of 7.8. This is a service that enables remediation and protection of Windows Update components, which could in turn be abused to run malicious programs with escalated permissions. So it seems a pretty common one where these updaters or update mechanisms are leveraged to run malicious code. And that's one of those instances again. There's also CVE-2021-36942 that contains fixes to secure systems against NTLM relay attacks like the Petit Potam, which I said before, I love that name, but uh, that vulnerability, but, and it does it by blocking the LSARPC interface to help protect against that specific attack. There's also CVE-2021-36936, and this resolves yet another remote code execution flaw in the Windows Print Spooler component. And this is one among three flaws in the print spooler service that Microsoft has fixed this month, all with a relatively high severity rating. In addition, Microsoft has released security updates to resolve a previously disclosed remote code execution in the print spooler service that was tracked as CVE-2021-34481 that I mentioned on a recent episode of the podcast. And that one changes the default behavior of the point and print feature, effectively preventing non-admin users from installing or updating new and existing printer drivers using drivers from a remote computer or server without first elevating themselves to an administrator. So that covers the Patch Tuesday news, but very worryingly, the very next day on Wednesday, CVE-2021-3. 36958 was published, which is a remote code execution vulnerability that exists when the print spooler service improperly performs privileged file operations. An attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could run arbitrary code with the system context. An attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or even create new accounts with full user rights. The workaround for this vulnerability is stopping and disabling the print spooler service. And the CV at this time, at least at the time of recording, does not list what operating systems are affected, meaning disabling the print spooler seems like completely unrealistic. What are you going to do? And are you going to go out and disable the print spooler on every single Windows operating system in your environment? I don't think so. Kevin Beaumont and Benjamin Delpy shared some details on how to easily grab system context in all versions of Windows, which is pretty scary stuff. I can't see how you're going to protect yourself against this right now. Hopefully Microsoft releases an out of band patch soon. And speaking of scary stuff in Benjamin Delpy, uh, Delpy is the creator of Mimi Cats, 
which is a really awesome security utility. He decided to try his product out on the Windows 365 Cloud PC that I talked at length about last week, and he made some very troubling discoveries about the security on the default provisioned base desktops. What is that discovery? He's able to grab passwords in plain text using the utility. So you log in to your Windows 365 Cloud PC. If someone runs the Mimi Cats utility, they could see your password in plain text. Ryan Mangan also followed up on Benjamin's findings and posted some of his own findings. One recommendation is using something like Credential Guard, but both Benjamin and Ryan have other recommendations too. And I won't tell you on this episode because Ryan did go to the trouble of creating a blog post about this. So I suggest you check it out for yourself for more detail. And I'll share a link to that with this episode, which is episode 189. And you'll find it on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links. And it's not ready yet, but I'm also going to be posting a general blog on the Windows 365 Cloud PC and my impressions of it that I hope to share soon. Um, Grabbing those passwords from like the default base desktop is one thing that being a security nightmare kind of makes sense somewhat. But of course you could use a tool to layer in security after provisioning the desktop. But what those tools are and if they're Microsoft tools or not, there's some possible gotchas on the management piece of the Windows 365 Cloud PC, at least on the business desktops. And I'll explain that in my blog post. In some more Windows 365 news, Christian Brinkhoff shared that the AppAssure program now supports Windows 365. AppAssure is of course the program Microsoft is running that provides a dedicated team of engineers to work on your app compatibility issues. So if you run into any app compat problems, you can leverage that team to help you get them working on the latest Windows OS. And that now includes Windows 365 too. Interestingly, in the announcement, Microsoft shared some of their numbers related to AppAssure. This includes the fact that they've evaluated over 809,000 apps, identifying 3,116 broken apps, meaning an overall compatibility rating of about 99.62%. Asus has released some BIOS updates for over 200 motherboard models to automatically enable the built-in TPM version 2 security process so that users can upgrade to Windows 11. So if you are currently rocking an Asus machine, it seems like odds are in your favor that it will be able to run Windows 11. Well, at least that the TPM requirement should not be a problem for you. In a quick follow-up to a story I covered on the podcast previously, The Washington Post this week reported that Apple has settled its lawsuit with Corellium. Corellium is a company who makes emulation software and security tooling for iOS devices. The terms of the settlement are confidential. Of course, Apple had lost a previous case against the company, and what we do know at least is that after this settlement, Corellium will still be able to continue selling their products. Some of the comments provided to the Washington Post is that it is good that Apple have stepped back on this. Which I guess we can kind of assume they did since Corellium will continue selling their products. But it seems a bit odd to me that they would settle rather than just drop the case since Corellium already won that last ruling. Perhaps Corellium got compensated in some way or maybe Apple reached an agreement to take a piece of the pie from Corellium's sales or something, I'm not really sure, but it's a little bit odd to me that they didn't just drop the case rather than reach a settlement. But that's just speculation on my part on why that might be. HIMSS, the Healthcare Information and Management System Society Conference, was held in Las Vegas this week. And believe it or not, it was an in-person event too. Fred Pennick from HITConsultant.net shared some of the highlights from the conference. I won't go through all of them, and I recommend you check out his great reports for yourself, but I did skim through and take what I consider some of my highlights from the announcements. And those include that Google shared some research data, including that telehealth saw substantial year-on-year growth, jumping nearly threefold from 32% in February 2020 to 90% this year. Of course, that's not surprising. They've had to adjust to the pandemic situation. But it's cool to see that that is now a thing and it's pretty solidified. 
45% of physicians say that COVID-19 accelerated the pace of the organization's adoption of technology, with more than three in five physicians saying that the pandemic has forced their healthcare organization to make technology upgrades that normally would have taken years. See what we can accomplish when we just try and put our collective minds to it. Salesforce were also at the conference and have announced that they've made their maps feature HIPAA compliant. There are also features now for helping to manage patients and medication lists, helping with patient scheduling and more. So it makes sense. I mean, Salesforce is really great for businesses, for tracking leads and sales process. It makes sense that it could be modified a little bit for being more healthcare friendly and useful. Aetna, which is a CVS healthcare company, announced the launch of the Aetna Virtual Primary Care, designed to reimagine the primary care experience and make it easier for people to get the health services they need anytime, anywhere. So CVS is a pretty interesting one because they did something pretty significant in rolling out things called Minute Clinics in the US, where they essentially opened uh, almost like a doctor's office in a lot of their pharmacies, which if you've ever been to the US, their pharmacies are everywhere. But instead of having a doctor, they're, they're usually being operated by nurse practitioners and they can handle um, certain types of illnesses, which is great because it keeps you away from going to your GP or your primary care physician. It's quick, it's convenient, and you get just as good care from the nurse practitioners, at least in my experience. And now obviously with this announcement, they're branching out into a telehealth and virtual primary care offering. Bose, the excellent headphones manufacturer, announced Sound Control Hearing Aids, which is the first US FDA cleared direct to consumer hearing aid developed for adults with perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. And it's now available nationwide in all of the 50 US states. So, yeah, HIMSS is pretty US healthcare focused. I probably should have led with that. Thus, the mention of things like nationwide to the US and HIPAA compliance and stuff like that, which is a data compliance within the US, not necessarily anywhere else. Verizon also had some announcements around their BlueJeans telehealth app, saying that patients can now share certain categories of their health data, including their heart rate, ECG, sleep, step count, falls, and mobility data directly into the app. So patients and healthcare providers can have more meaningful and tangible health-related conversations then it can improve the overall outcome of the visit. And that was another kind of cool thing in the US when I was living there. If you want to, you could use things like your Apple Watch or your Fitbit and some of that data and provide it to your healthcare provider so they kind of get more of a day-to-day -day visibility of your general health outside of just that point in time visit that you have. Now, of course, it was kind of twofold in the US, double-edged sword there because yeah, it might give more insight into your health for the doctor who's treating you, but there was also concerns that you're maybe giving your insurance company more information that they could use to beat you over the head with. So probably not so much of a problem in most of Europe and other parts of the developed world, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword in the US. Last highlight, which again, this is just some of the highlights. I definitely recommend you check out the hitconsultant.net link, and I'll share that with this episode for more. But Samsung unveiled their new suite of Galaxy devices that can help hospitals and healthcare workers increase their productivity and more easily work from anywhere. This will include a foldable smartphone, the Galaxy Z Fold 3, and smartwatches such as the Galaxy Watch 4 Classic and Galaxy Watch 4, which can be used to monitor patient health data. So if you've never worked in healthcare before, you might be surprised, but a lot of really useful healthcare products are based off of mobile phones. So a lot of like mobile rover devices and different tracking devices for patients and charting and stuff like that are actually running off mobile devices like iPads or iPhones or indeed Galaxy watches and phones too. So pretty cool. Silicon Angle this week reported that Avaya have acquired CT integrations to expand the capabilities of its OneCloud product suite, 
which stands at the center of the company's plan to move to a cloud-centric business model. They report that the platform is used by companies to manage the day-to-day -day operations of their contact centers. And CT Integrations has developed a software tool called CT Suite that extends OneCloud CCAAS with complementary capabilities not included in the default feature set. And what this means, maybe from a bottom line perspective, well, Avaya is forecasting revenues of $2.93 billion to $2.96 billion. And OneCloud is expected to account for between $490 million to $500 million of that total. And by the end of the next year, Avaya expects the OneCloud's share of total sales will more than double. So, cloud is a lucrative business. MS Power User reported that Microsoft announced the acquisition of Peer5, a company that operates peer-to-peer -peer CDN worldwide. Microsoft will leverage Peer5's technology and expertise to expand its ability for delivering secure, high-quality, large-scale live video streaming with optimized network performance in Microsoft Teams. It said that Peer5 offers a web RTC-based ECDN solution that runs in browser to optimize bandwidth usage, helping mitigate impacts to network and line of business applications. Its mesh networks are self-balancing and automatically scale at the number of viewers increase. And also the technology does not require additional installation on, on user endpoints or changes to the physical network infrastructure, which that's become kind of a hot topic with people working from home. A lot of these video conferencing softwares need an additional agent on people's endpoints that they're working on kind of like these vdi clients to help redirect the audio and optimize it and that's never a good thing because you might not have tech savvy people they don't know how to install that if they're working remote or if they're possibly using their own device maybe they don't even want to install it if it's their own device so this seems like a better path forward to not require that anymore Microsoft also confirmed that it will continue to support third-party ECDN solutions from Microsoft certified partners in addition to Peer5 ECDN. Also, current Peer5 customers will be able to continue using the service. Norton LifeLock and Avast are merging in a deal worth more than a reported $8 billion. The Verge suggests the combination should lead to antivirus products that include the benefits of Avast's focus on privacy and Norton LifeLock's experience in identity, kind of bringing the best of both expertise sets, product sets, and worlds. According to The Verge, Avast, which was founded in the Czech Republic, has been creating software for consumers and small businesses for 11 years and acquired AVG five years ago. Norton LifeLock is the former consumer side of Symantec, which used to be very widely deployed, and that was left behind after Broadcom acquired Symantec's enterprise security business two years ago. And then Norton Antivirus has existed in various forms since 1991 and has remained pretty popular, particularly for the consumer side for the last 30 years, probably more so than enterprise. But Semantic was a player in that space. I don't think The Verge mentioned it there, but Norton had also acquired a company called LifeLock, which is about that identity protection. So I think that's kind of the merging those two worlds. LifeLock with Norton for that identity and Avast focusing on privacy and security. And obviously Norton for antivirus as well. Plus Avast and AVG was, well, it used to be a pretty good antivirus. I'm not sure about recently because I haven't used it recently. The Caseus Universal Revel decryption key has been leaked on a public forum according to bleepycomputer.com. The decryption key has been provided to victims for a few weeks now but CNN reported that they were only provided the decryption key if they agreed to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So I guess someone might have broken their NDA by sharing it widely, although Bleepy Computer seems to suggest the person who leaked the decryption key is actually a part of the cyber gang and not a victim. Of course, while it is great to get that decryption key, that's only really the start of the battle, as you'll see with victims like recent victims, the HSE in Ireland and others have shown that getting the key is just one step of a million to get things restored again. I'm actually right now trying to figure out how to pay a hospital bill from Monday in Ireland because the online payment portal is still down and that attack actually took place at the beginning of May. So 
It's really dragging things out. Speaking of ransomware, Synology have warned that there are active ransomware attacks happening to customers using their NAS devices. Now, Bleepy Computer carried out a statement from the vendor saying that they have only received 50 reports from people who fell victim to these attacks. But regardless, the company advised users to go through a checklist to defend their devices against attacks. And that includes the use of a complex and strong password and applying those rules to all users of the NAS. Create a new account in the admin group and disable the system default admin account. Enable auto block in control panel to block IP addresses with too many failed login attempts. And also run security advisor to make sure there is no weak passwords in the system. The company said to ensure the security of your Synology NAS, we strongly recommend you enable firewall and control panel and, and only allow public ports for services when necessary. And also enable two step verification to prevent unauthorized login attempts. You may also want to enable Snapshot to keep your NAS immune to encryption-based ransomware. Which, I don't think it really keeps them immune, it just means you can restore from a backup, right? <laughs> but still, really good advice if you use a Synology device, ensure all these are configured correctly. In another one that could affect the home labbers in particular, bleepycomputer.com reported this week on an authentication bypass vulnerability impacting home routers with the Arcadian firmware, which could be leveraged to manipulate and deploy Mirai botnet malicious payloads. The vulnerability is being tracked as CVE-2021-20090, and it is a critical path traversal vulnerability with a 9.9 out of 10 severity rating. And this exists in the web interfaces of routers with the firmware that could allow unauthenticated remote attackers to bypass authentication. And this is under active attack. If you if you don't really think about your home router often, you may not realize it runs this kind of firmware because millions of routers are affected, including those from Asus, British Telecom, Orange, O2 or Telefonica, Verizon, Vodafone, Telstra, and more. The vulnerability exists in at least 20 devices and there's a list provided in the article which I'll share. So it's time for a router firmware upgrade, everyone. The article also suggests attacks started about two days after an exploit was shared online, which amplifies just how quickly you have to patch in this day and age. It was reported this week that Accenture got hit with ransomware from the Lockbit ransomware gang, who also put out a statement that said, quote, these people are beyond privacy and security. I really hope that their services are better than what I saw as an insider. If you're interested in buying some databases, reach us, end quote. For their part, Accenture acknowledged the attack, but said it had little impact on their operations. In a statement, they said, quote, through our security controls and protocols, we identified irregular activity in one of our environments. We immediately contained the matter and isolated the affected servers. We fully restored our affected systems from backup. There was no impact on Accenture's operations or on our clients' systems, end quote. While Accenture downplayed the attack, the gang have published proof online that they do have data from the company and have said that their negotiations are ongoing for a $50 million ransom. So it may not have affected their operations, but it seems like there's been a data leak. The Record Media reported this week that the Dutch government, which is the last EU country that is still running its own certificate authority, have announced plans to stop issuing new TLS certificates starting December 2021. Three reasons cited for them discontinuing the program include the ever-increasing technical requirements imposed by browser makers for running a compliant TLS certificate authority, Security incidents the program suffered in 2019 and 2020, which forced its staff to replace a large number of certificates for its customers. And also the fact that the Netherlands is the last country in the EU to run its own CA, with all other governments offloading the process to the private sector. It does say, regardless of that last line, that they're only discontinuing the TLS certificates and they will continue to produce other types of certs. 
In an interesting development this week, it appears a member of a ransomware gang got scorned and decided to strike back by releasing manuals and technical guides used by the Conte gang to train affiliate members on how to access, move laterally, and escalate access inside a hacked company and then exfiltrate its data before encrypting files. Some public IP addresses were also shared on Twitter with a suggestion to people to block those IP addresses, obviously because those are probably command servers. It appears the archive of the documents is still available at the time of this recording, and it includes a treasure trove of how-to guides. Obviously, I don't encourage anyone to start using these guides to carry out attacks, but it could be useful for helping to keep yourself informed and for informing you how to protect you and your organizations. I think personally, this is one of the times I would probably download this into a sandbox and be as cautious as possible. This week, Malware Tech Blog shared a really concerning video showing how to bypass the Windows resource protection to drop files into sensitive system folders on Windows, which can lead to all kinds of problems. If you're not familiar with the Windows resource protection or WRP, that's supposed to basically secure those system directories so that you can't remove system components, either purposely or erroneously, or copy into those directories without elevation. So definitely check out that video if you're interested. Chris Matthews had some really interesting announcements this week. First up, his new Metaverses project that allows you to easily create your own 3D virtual web space. His vision right now is that this will be the future of the web. So rather than traversing the web and going to flat traditional websites, you could have an immersive experience with a web space, particularly if you're using a virtual reality headset. His guide shows that you can create your own metaverse in three simple steps, starting by registering and claiming a verse name in one step, then creating a JSON file and uploading it to your site, and finally, just invite your friends, colleagues, and customers and start using the space. Also announced this week by him was a Group Room Citrix micro app. So I covered the Cisco integration with Group Room uh, for WebEx a few weeks ago, and now there's this awesome Citrix micro app. So getting some really nice enterprise integrations going for Group Room. With this micro app, you could quickly create a virtual room be it the basic matrix room, a large conference room, or even a large office space plan, or even that 3D room similar to the metaverse we just talked about. And then you can also have meeting activities recorded into an activity feed within your Citrix workspace, or even send messages to the room from the Citrix workspace portal. So essentially allowing you to do pretty much anything you might want to do with group room, right from within the Citrix workspace portal. So very cool stuff. And to wrap up the news for this week, I've got a few quick hit stories I'd like to run through. First up, congratulations to community legend Jim Moyle for completing the Cape Wrath Ultra Marathon that he completed in just over eight days and a distance of 400 kilometers. Incredible stuff. And he was doing it to raise money for a worthy charity, Dementia UK, so please consider donating. While giving out congratulations, congrats to David O'Brien, the founder of Argos, a company specializing in cloud security on his company turning one year old. So great achievement, and it seems like it's going from strength to strength. So continued best of luck, David. Also some really great community news, the Virtual Expo held by Eric at zenapblog.com will be held on Friday, the 24th of September, and he has put out a call for speakers. So if you'd like to present, this is a really excellent opportunity to speak at a premier online event. Unfortunately, I'm too late announcing this one, but the early bird discounted tickets for E2EVC in Lisbon went on sale over the weekend. They are now sold out but you could still get a ticket when the next round of tickets are put on sale. And congratulations to Alex for E2E in Hamburg. It sounds like he went through the wars leading up to the event and I hope he feels better soon. I enjoyed it, so good job as always. Microsoft announced availability zone support for Azure automation is coming soon. 
last week I had a story that I included in the script, but I accidentally didn't read it out when recording. So kind of going back to that one because it was pretty interesting. Bleeping Computer had reported a potential leak by Microsoft as they spotted that a Windows hardware certification post and an Intel July graphics driver release notes suggested that the plan is to release Windows 11 in October or at least are at the latest in November of this year. So I guess time will tell. The Verge reported this week that Parallels version 17 now allows you to run Windows 11 on your Mac and should do when the OS is released. But if you want to and you want to get started today, it does include the ability to run the available previews. Finally, in a bit of fun news, torrentfreak.com noticed and reported that a Ukrainian television channel sent a takedown request to Google that looked to be a URL pointing to a playlist file on a streaming service. So it kind of looked like they thought that maybe someone was taking some of their streaming content and bootlegging it. But the catch was, what the company submitted for the takedown was a URL that contained 127.0.0.1. So they put a takedown request in for content that was residing on one of their own local machines. Derp. Hopefully whoever submitted it could see the funny side of it too. No one had stolen anything. They were looking at their own machine. And now, this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. Guy Leach shared a really useful Unix Linux command reference sheet and reminded us all that many of these also work in PowerShell thanks to the aliases available within it. This week I saw a Back to the Future utility that was shared on GitHub that helps you find patterns of vulnerabilities on Windows in order to find zero day and write exploits of one days. They say they use Microsoft security updates in order to find the patterns and the outputted content from the script looks really amazing. It's got a nice little kind of dependency map or almost like a topology view. So it's very cool stuff. Paul Wynn Stanley shared a great blog post on converting to virtual machine scale set cloud management gateway. So if you're a system center user and you live and breathe that stuff, check out that blog post. Abhishek Prakash blogged about a tool called OneDriver which acts as a kind of OneDrive client for Linux. So it doesn't have the full features of the Windows client, but does allow you to mount a directory pointing to your OneDrive and even download all the contents for offline access. So if you're a Linux desktop user, I mean, I pity you if you are, if you're using that as your primary machine, but if you are, this looks like a good option for using OneDrive. Anoop Sinair has a nice blog post on how to set a custom start menu layout using Intune, which will be very relevant for those trying the enterprise cloud PC in Windows 365. So if you're playing with that right now, check out that blog post. And once again, of course, Thorsten shared a couple of really nice DISM commands for backing up your current PC drivers. So that's probably something you should do somewhat routinely to make sure if you need to wipe your machine, you've got the drivers handy to get everything back up and running pretty quickly again. I saw that on Adam the Automator, John Case shared his five PowerShell script examples to inspire you to get scripting. So a nice one if you're starting out with PowerShell. The mighty Paul Meehan was featured by Silicon Republic this week, and he was discussing how organizations are adopting a cloud-first strategy without necessarily understanding the impacts or risks, and he goes through what they should consider. So if you're into cloud and all things cloud, This could be a good one for you to read. The awesome AVD Zero to Hero show dropped episode nine recently, and it's a look at securing AVD with multi-factor authentication and more. And I actually think this one's pretty relevant to Windows 365 as well, because as I talked about earlier and what I'll blog about soon, security is one of those aspects that you need to really put some attention and focus on. Out of the box, it's just not there. And finally, an awesome resource for everyone, Pluralsight is holding one of its free weekends starting Friday the 13th, running through the 15th. So if you want to mark your weekend out and 
get some learning in, this is a really great opportunity. I apologize if the audio is not very good this week. I was under the weather again, the cost of having young kids, and I try to continue to just put out a podcast episode every week, whether I'm sick or traveling or whatever, I try to put it out. So sometimes the audio is not going to be as good as others, and this is one of those weeks, so I apologize. But thank you all so much for listening anyway, and have a great weekend and rest of the work week.